northern third of Africa is a massive expanse of land smothered in the sands of the Sahara Desert. The Sahara is the largest hot desert in the world, positioned between the Atlantic Ocean to the west and the Red Sea to the east, and between the Mediterranean Sea to the north and the Sahel to the south. It covers numerous countries, including Egypt, Algeria, Libya, Niger, Mali, Chad, Morocco, Tunisia, Mauritania, and Sudan. The desert itself has numerous expanses of barren sand dunes, some reaching up nearly 300 meters off the mineral surface of the ground. Although the vast majority of the Sahara is, more or less, just this mineral surface, exposed to the sun and the air, eroded by a stream of dust and sand propelled by the wind. Plateaus of rugged stone, flat fields of gravel and boulders, the desiccated remains of lake beds, and the blindingly white wasteland of salt flats. These are the geographic features that define much of the Sahara. Throughout this scorched mineral wasteland, there are scattered eruptions of mountains, like the Atlas Mountains to the northwest, and the Ahagar Mountains and the Tibesti Mountains in the heart of the Sahara. The Sahara exists in a region where the air from higher in the atmosphere tends to sink down towards the surface creating a literal sink of high-pressure, dry air coming down in a continuous descending current. This climate pretty much precludes the formation of clouds, and so the landscape is extremely dry. It gets little to no rain, with some regions in the Sahara going years and years without seeing any rain clouds at all. Furthermore, the lack of clouds means that the Sahara gets year-round exposure to almost entirely uninterrupted sunlight. The sun creeps across the sky, almost directly overhead, glaring down directly onto the surface with a punishing heat, routinely raising the midday temperature highs well past 100 degrees Fahrenheit, with record temps recorded in Algeria at upwards of 115 degrees. The ground itself gets even hotter than the air. The sand in the early afternoon can be as hot as 80 degrees Celsius, or 176 degrees Fahrenheit. The sand in the Sahara, in and of itself, is actually a really important ecological variable. The Sahara Desert is a massive source for fine mineral particles, which can get lifted up in sandstorms and blown high into the air, getting carried all over the world to rain down in the soil on other continents. These mineral particles are nutrients for plants, and their airborne spread brings nutrients and revitalizes soils. The Amazon rainforest, for example, is dependent on the dust clouds that get carried across the Atlantic, as these bring the mineral nutrients that fertilize the Amazonian soils. The harsh wind in the Sahara perpetually works to erode rocks and cliffs and mountains, contributing to the natural replenishment of the sand that gets carried out on the wind to other continents. The center of the Sahara gets virtually no rainfall, ever. Along the northern and southern borders of the Sahara, like where it approaches the Mediterranean coast in the north and the savanna of the Sahel in the south, in these regions there's very limited rainfall. But despite the blistering temperature, the near total lack of rain and water, and the brutally rugged landscape, the Sahara is home to a small variety of life. Life is able to penetrate this wasteland, and life grows even in the most inhospitable places. Naturally, life grows in the most hospitable parts of the Sahara, like the strips of land running along the coasts of the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. In a thin band of vegetation running down the western coastal border of the Sahara, an explorer would find a grassland that's rich in succulent plants like cactus and aloe, and various drought-resistant lichens and shrubs. The vegetation attracts herbivores like the Dorcas gazelle, which attracts predators like desert foxes, jackals, and sand cats, which themselves attract larger predators who are willing to kill and eat anything that's smaller than them, like honey badgers and striped hyena. Along the Mediterranean coastline, the ecology is also relatively flush with vegetation, with some areas having entire forests, and this attracts all manner of herbivores and carnivores. Various types of gazelle, like the Dama, the Dorcas, and the Rim gazelle, the Barbary sheep, the North African ostrich, the striped polecat, and the spotted and striped hyenas are all some of the larger animals roaming these Mediterranean and uh, Atlantic habitats. 
Because grasses and shrubs are really common in these habitats, the ground is carpeted in a thick layer of brushy vegetation, and this provides a kind of mini canopy for ground-dwelling life. Numerous species of rodents, like voles, gerboas, and gerbils, thrive here, feeding off of the relatively ample foliage and enjoying the protection of the thick underbrush. Near the mountain ranges of central and western Sahara, like the Ahagar and the Tabesti, and the Tassili Najir Mountains, the uplifted ground disrupts the airflow and shakes moisture out of the air. These highland regions get more rainfall and thus have a slightly higher humidity, which better regulates temperature and makes the mountainside summers a little cooler and more tolerable than the summers of the lowland desert everywhere around them. Even though these habitats are more hospitable for life, they're still pretty harsh. The forests of cypress trees, myrtle trees, acacia trees, and olive trees that grow here are all spread out, with the individual trees gnarly and isolated, unable to grow too close to each other, lest they start competing to death over water. Similar highland regions in the eastern Sahara also enjoy a generally higher humidity, slightly cooler daytime temps, and a little bit more rainfall. These qualities make them relatively fertile compared to the surrounding landscape, and they can host uh, larger, complex plants like acacia trees, oleander, tamarisks, and date palms. All of these relatively humid highland areas are home to herbivorous mammals like gazelles, sheep, rodents, hares, and adax, and carnivorous mammals like foxes, cheetah, wild dogs, jackals, and hyenas. The cheetahs are an important predator in the Sahara, but their numbers are dwindling. The cheetah hunt down larger prey animals in their habitats, like the rim gazelle, the dama gazelle, and the adax. During the hottest months of the year, the cheetahs, and many other animals for that matter, tend to avoid the direct sunlight, and they spend a lot of their time in the shadows of tall bushes and savanna trees. Reptiles are also really characteristic animals in the Sahara, like the crocodiles that hang out near watering holes where all the larger ungulates want to be and the snakes and the monitor lizards that hunt through the grasslands and the shrubs to feed on the plethora of rodents. There's a small flowering plant called Tribulus terrestris, which grows heavily in the fertile valleys and the more mountainous regions. During the rainy seasons, water flows through these valleys and allows the terrestrial plants to really go wild. But this also brings in standing water and moist soils, which are great for the desert locusts to lay their eggs. The locust eggs will hatch, and the larvae will feed off of the leaves on these tribulus terrestris plants. So if there's a lot of these plants, if they are able to grow wild and unrestricted because of all the incoming seasonal water, then that means that there's a lot of nutrition available to the locust larvae. And if enough of them are successful in a given breeding season, in a given wet season, they can turn into swarms of mature locusts that can sweep through and destroy crops across not just northern Africa, but also Europe, the Middle East, and Western Asia. A few small regions along the coastline of the Sahara are very lowland depressions, like lake beds or basins. During the rainy season, when the rivers near the coast are swollen with runoff, these lowlands can flood. For example, the flat plains around the rivers, like the Nile, will flood, and this feeds a dense but brief explosion in seasonal growth. These coastal depressions will often fill with salt water, and seasonal, salt-tolerant plants will vibrantly emerge. These halophytic communities are dense, if somewhat ephemeral, nodes of life. The harshest part of the Sahara lies in its center, in the lowland desert regions that are surrounded by the mountains. These regions get the full glare of the sun, the least airflow, the least humidity, the least rainfall, and thus they have the least life. In much of central Sahara, the landscape is almost totally devoid of life. Not even heat-tolerant grasses and shrubs can withstand the heat, and not even drought-tolerant cactus and assorted succulents can withstand the aridity. These succulent plants have thick stems to stabilize them against the Saharan wind, and they have small leaves to minimize surface area for transpiration, to protect them against water loss in the Saharan sun. Many of these species have a remarkable capacity to withstand droughts, to withstand prolonged periods of extreme desiccation. However, this hellish expanse of scorched wasteland is interrupted by hundreds of small, scattered oases, 
areas where underground rivers and aquifers come up to the surface to form small ponds and lakes. Insects will come and lay their eggs in the water, and this will attract birds, who come to feed off of the insects. The bird droppings create the first initial substrate for other organisms like plants and fungus to grow off of. Plants are attracted to the oasis because of the anomalous source of water, and animals are attracted to the oasis because of both the water and the plants that they can eat. Some oases can be little more than a few shrubs and bushes surrounding a small water hole, while others can be a veritable mini-forest with trees and tall shrubs all growing densely together around a, a decent-sized lake. West of the Ahagar Mountains is a lowland region of the Sahara called the Tanazruft. This is the harshest, hottest, driest, most barren part of the Sahara, with almost no precipitation and just as little life. This region is flat and brown, composed of a seemingly endless expanse of dusty sandstone. Life can thrive in almost every place on Earth. Given enough time, life can adapt and overcome, and turn even the most inhospitable places into viable habitats. But even the adaptive capacity of life has its limits, and those limits are met at the Tanis Ruft, the soul of the Sahara, where there's so little water available that there is no vegetation. The only life forms are the microbes in the soil. The Sahara is a harsh and brutal place, unforgiving and in many ways horrible, yet it's also beautiful and ecologically fragile. Despite all of its bleak qualities, life persists here. Life is densest and most varied along the edges of the Sahara by the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea, but it decreases in density as you travel further and further inland. The numerous oases and the mountain highlands offer a, a temporary humid refuge for plants and animals, but the desert landscape is unforgiving, it's unrelenting, and as you keep going farther and farther inland, it gets drier and drier, until you come to the Tanis Ruft, the wasteland at the heart of the Sahara. <laughs>